We've got quite a few attendees today, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Everyone should be arriving to our webinar. I want to thank everybody for coming and taking an hour out of your day to join us for uh, our second webinar in our leadership series here at Cortis Loop. Uh, this one is particularly focused on the impact of COVID-19 on the future of data science. We've got some amazing panelists um, <clears throat> joining us today, um, who's going to be introduced by Carol McCall, who is our Chief Health Analytics Officer here at Closed Loop. Um, I do want to encourage everyone to make this as interactive a session as possible. So um, use the Q&A feature, use the chat feature um, within Zoom, and we will be sure to grab your questions and ask those of the panelists. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Carol to introduce our panelists and talk about a little bit about, about the agenda for today. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, hi, I'm Carol McCall. As Chris said, I'm a, a Chief Health Analytics Officer here at Closed Loop, and it's really going to be, um, I think, a great, I don't know if it's morning where you are or afternoon where you are, but I think it's going to be a, a great hour. Um, and thank you, as Chris said, for make, just making the time to attend. I think it's going to be a great session. Um, Again, I think we have a compelling topic and some really engaging speakers. And so what I'd like to do is just take a moment and introduce our panelists here. So, and what they have in common is these, these gentlemen here have deep involvement in healthcare analytics and AI over uh, many, many years. I think all in, it's, it's probably more than half a century of experience here. Um, what's different is that in addition to their uh, diverse backgrounds is that their organizations have faced some, some distinct challenges here with respect to COVID-19. And so I think their combined perspectives here are going to uh, create a, paint a very broad picture of COVID's impacts and the kind of permanent impact that we might be able to see um, on data science and healthcare. And so our first panelist is Dave DiCaprio. He is Chief Technology Officer here at Closed Loop and co-founder of CloseLoop.ai. And he graduated from MIT with a degree in electrical engineering, computer science, and he has managed to accumulate more than 20 years of experience and using advanced technologies to transform businesses. And his experience ranges from, it's, it's incredibly wide, from uh, genome research, including time on the Human Genome Project to pharmaceutical development and healthcare, but also things like sports analytics and transportation logistics, robotics, and financial markets. So um, really excited to hear what Dave has to say. We also have Scott Ogden. He leads the data science efforts at Health First, which is New York's largest not-for-profit health insurer. And he's responsible for driving all of their data science strategies to improve outcomes and reduce costs and expand their business. And when he's not hurting his data scientists, he's hurting his actual two cats and his amazing eight-month-old or he's out buying guitars and conducting or arranging music for choirs. So a very diverse background there. And I don't know what happened to Steve. We're getting a lovely view of something here with, uh, with the good Mr. Steve LaFar. Um, Steve is, uh, he's an accomplished executive. I've known him for a long time. He's got more than 25 years of experience in healthcare with expertise in strategy and analytics and software. He's currently the executive director of uh, Strata Data Science and that's the analytic group within Strata Decision Technology. And prior to that, he was CEO of Applied Pathways, which was acquired by AIM Healthcare. He was CEO of SG2, which was a consulting and analytics firm that was also acquired uh, by Med Assets. And he was president of Medireg's, which was acquired by a Walters Kluwer. So he's just got a trail of successful. In, in uh, other words, I can't keep a job. Or something <laughs> like that, right? So um, anyway, we're going to have a, a, a fun time with, with these guys here today. Um, but before we turn to our panelists, I wanted to give a very brief overview um, of Closed Loop, who we are, and, and kind of how we came to actually even have a point of view of, of COVID-19 and through some of the work that we've done. So very briefly, just a little bit of context. Um, the company has been around for about three years. And uh, predictive analytics in healthcare and machine learning, this is literally all we do. It's the only thing that we focus on. Um, most recently, we actually, we had been announced as one of the uh, top 25 finalists in the CMS AI for Outcomes Challenge. And that work, as well as the overall platform that we have, is really what put us in a position um, to build the models that we've done that are specific to COVID-19. So briefly, when we talk about closed loop, we really call it healthcare's data science platform. And, and that's because it boils down to really two pillars of technology. And, and the first is this machine learning automation platform that's built specifically for healthcare. Um, there's also a, a catalog of off-the-shelf models that are 
common healthcare use cases for things like readmissions and utilization and, and suspect diagnoses. And with this platform, which is kind of a workbench for data scientists, it helps data scientists build models better, faster, cheaper, and is what Dave is gonna talk about uh, when he says we spent three years building a platform that allowed us to build a model in a weekend, and which is really kind of how this whole thing played out. So with respect to our work um, for COVID-19, we thought we could help because of the CDC's guidelines and the guidance that they put out for people that were more vulnerable were true, but essentially they just simply weren't precise enough to be deeply useful. And what we knew from our work for CMS was that vulnerability was concentrated. It was concentrated in a subset of people and it also wasn't the same level of vulnerability to serious illness for everybody that had a risk factor. And what we believed that we could do was to identify who those people were, which would then make it possible for care management teams to do outreach and help them shelter in place. And so that's what we did. We built some models, we call it the C19 index. You can learn more about it at, at c19index.com. But uh, what they do is they identify the degree to which a person is, if they do become infected, um, has heightened vulnerability to becoming very sick and a severe illness from COVID-19. We open sourced that and made it available to organizations to implement in their own systems. And we also in turn helped organizations that needed help deploying that. And so that's been our experience. It's been uh, wonderfully successful um, and just incredibly rewarding to know that, that we, even though we're not on the front lines of this fight, uh, we can provide a lot of important tools who are actually trying to, to do that, that hard work. Um, so with that context, uh, we're gonna turn it over to our panelists, but before we do, Actually, Chris is going to ask a question. So we, we have some polling questions, is that right, Chris? That is right. So <clears throat> throughout the webinar, you guys might see just a few questions pop up. We just wanna kind of sort of gauge the audience uh, on a few questions around data science. So an example of what that might look like. Um, so you're gonna see um, sort of this first poll pop up um, and you can answer at your leisure. Um, and this is gonna sort of help, you know, drive to the discussion for uh, our panelists today. So uh, you should see that first question come up and then you can answer that. Um, we All right. will close the poll here in just a few right. seconds. So while you're taking that, we're gonna actually start, um, Dave, we're gonna start with you. All right, so I'd love to talk, have you talk a little bit about what it was like to create those C19 index models. So. Um, talk a little bit about that. Is it different than other things that, that we've done with the platform? Was it more variation on a theme? What was that like? Yeah. Um, so, so in a lot of ways, it, it was a variation on a theme. What we do, uh, it's very similar to some of the models that we build and our customers build every day for readmissions or utilization or other use cases. I, there were a few special things, obviously, about this one. Um, really, the, the kind of looking at the outcome and the time frame were probably the two biggest differences. Uh, the, the outcome, if, if you think back to where we were, this is March 10th, we made the decision to do this. So it was pretty early in the whole COVID thing. Before there was really any COVID data, um, you know, at, at that point, the only data that had really become available was still from China. It was very earlier in the US. You were talking, you, you know, uh, it, you know, you were maybe in the hundreds to low thousands of cases at that point. I think there may have been 5,000 cases when we, uh, right. when we started um, and, and no real deaths or, or things hadn't progressed there at that point. So, you know, how do you build a model to predict something when you don't have any data about it? So that was probably the biggest challenge. Uh, and, and there, that was really a matter of going back to what we did know in the biology that we could find and sort of um, figure out which diseases were closest. And right. uh, we defined a, the surrogate endpoint. So we basically just looked for who are people who are vulnerable to complications of upper rep respiratory infections generally. And then let's make the leap that those people are probably uh, uh, most susceptible to COVID or most right. vulnerable for COVID infections. Um, you know, especially given what we know now about how this disease is different than, you know, a typical flu. Um, you know, we know that that's not completely the case, but um, we also have validated the work we did uh, against real data now that it's available. And we do know that uh, the vulnerability index that we have is much more accurate than, say, a simple comorbidity score. Right. Uh, 
all your, you know, if you're just looking at general risk, um, we can do much better than that, even with the original uh, outcome that we had. So, Interesting. Um, talk a little bit about how the models evolved from its initial version. It wasn't kind of a once and done, right? Right, right. Yeah. This is another way that things are a little bit different for, uh, uh, for this one. You know, normally we're working with customers, they're using our platform. In this case, we wanted to get the model dispersed as widely as possible, so we open sourced it. Um, and that, you know, that, that creates a different dynamic. Normally we're very engaged with our customers while they're building and using these things. And all of a sudden we put this model out there. And, uh, and, and the real thing that came out, we built this model originally using Medicare data. We had access to some Medicare data for research. We were able to build it. And when we released it, we appropriate, did all the appropriate data science, good scientific citizens, and caveated everything we did that said, this model is only appropriate for a senior population or a Medicare population. Don't use it on a regular population. Um, but when you put things out there in the world in the middle of a pandemic and people need solutions to problems they're going to use what they use right. um so, you know that was one of the things that we realized very quickly when we put this out um you know the people were using it outside of the population it was intended to be used on and at, as a data si as data scientists we could say that's not a proper use of the model but as human beings going <laughs> through the pandemic with everybody else we were like we got to solve this problem um and so right. uh, you know, many thanks here. We had a conversation with Scott specifically at Health First and talked about this problem and we needed a way to get a younger population and a more representative population of the U.S. because we needed to improve this index. Um, Health First did a great job. But they immediately stepped up and gave us access uh, to the data so we could build a model that was a much more useful model for the overall population. And, right. Uh, I think you know that was a great case of probably some overcoming some institutional hurdles that probably would have been more difficult to do outside of uh, outside of the pandemic situation. But people just saying, "Hey, let's just do the right thing and let's get this out there," and you know we're going to trust that all this is going to be done safely. Right, right. Actually, we um, uh, we're going to shift gears just a little bit, and actually, I want to turn it over and. and and talk with Scott. Um, Scott's so busy, he's everywhere, right? Uh, <laughs> he keeps popping in. Um, yeah. But first, I do want to, I also want to thank you and the other leaders at Help First. Um, basically, this, this idea of data sharing, there's a lot of, of data hoarding that people can do, and yet it's amazing to see the types of things that people do and are willing to, to uh, contribute during the time of the pandemic. And this sharing of the insights from this other population allowed it to be integrated you know into these open source models and um and so i will say this uh of all the organizations that we asked um to to share we asked more than one yours was the only one that came through so thank you again you and, and the other leaders there um yeah. so i uh i'd love to start by having you talk a little bit about what your job was like and by which i mean is leading a data science team at a health plan serving vulnerable people and living in new york city which is the epicenter of this pandemic when this storm front came in what was that like so um i had i had just gotten back from a cruise of all things when when uh this this we you know we decided that you know everyone's going to work from home but also right when Dave announced that there was this idea on the table. Um, what we, what we were sort of, we were pulled in a million different directions at that time. We, we were asked for insights um, by every leader in, in a ton of different ways that, um, it, so really it was, it was just all hands on deck chaos um, at the, at that time. Um, and I, I think there wasn't really a good, there wasn't really a strategy of, 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 of what we should work on first, what we should work on next. And, and, and what, I, what I wanted out of those first couple weeks was to distill like, what are the key foundations for what we need to do for this? And, yeah. and the couple of them being like, how the, how the heck can we identify members with COVID? And um, are there atypical risk factors for, from this, for, for this disease that, that are, that are, not evident in the current right. let's say data products or models that we 
produced as a company um, or historically have produced like Charleston, Alex Hauser, what have you. So it was, right. it was really, really trying to wrap our heads around, okay, we, we have a ton of different data systems and how can we unify them all together in a, in a consistent framework to, to try and address the chaos of all those questions? Well, early on, I mean, so let's talk data. Um, there are ICD-10 codes for yeah. COVID, right? But I mean, it, it's, I could imagine, was it that simple? I mean, how did you know no. whether or not somebody actually had, you know, COVID-19? Um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's an amazing point. And I think um, what we've been able to demonstrate at Health First is that um, the, the answer to that problem is so dynamic. It changed day to day, week to week, especially in those first weeks. And, and it's going to continue to change. Um, and what we, what we were able to demonstrate to the organization is that it's not just a report. It's not a one and done thing that you can leave forever to just run. You have to, you have to follow the current guidelines from the CDC. You have to be creative in the sources of the data. So at the time, there's no claims because claims take a long time to process, right? So right. instead of looking at claims, look at authorizations, but authorizations often aren't specific. So you might have to look into problem lists and do some light NLP kind of work to, 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 to flag COVID or COVID related symptoms. Um, right. so, so really like layering in multiple data sources from auths to, to uh, clinical notes, to case, to care manager notes and all, all like everything to, needed to come together. It needed to come together fast. And I think that, right that demonstrated a different like that was a differentiator i think between traditional reporting analytics and like what a data science how a data scientist would approach that problem right 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 so that's a big shift um what are you told me a story what was your zip code story tell me the share the zip code story. <laughs> zip code story. yeah so like i said at the, at the start of this is is we we wanted to build a capability, an asset, if you will, a data asset of everything possible related to COVID as wide as possible, as flexible as possible to answer any of these questions. So it was, I think it was, I think I told you this last week, Carol, it was, it was like last Monday, our CEO sent um, uh, a request to, to like every VP in the, in the company, right? Saying, how do we, like, we saw on Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York's uh, list that these zip codes are high risk in general for, for New York. Can we, can we analyze them? And then uh, can we take it a little step further and, and, and figure out what, uh, what zip codes might be like those zip codes or even riskier? So right. if, we hadn't set, if we hadn't set up the problem as, as like, have we, if we didn't architect the problem as getting the data in one place getting all these new metrics, including the COVID index, the continuity of care, the fragility, which is an insane predictor of mortality in this time, um, index. So all these new indices, like new data products that are data science products with, that didn't exist at all at Health First before COVID, um, we were able to do that within hours, not years, right? It, it didn't have to be this long research program. We just sort of were able to pick and choose and, and, tell, and tell our CEO, like, this is how risky we think these zip codes are according to seven different metrics, including right. the COVID-19 index. And if, you're, if you want to target through community engagement and outreaches, like uh, on the geography level, if you want to target other zip codes, well, here's here's the zip codes that are risky on all of those metrics. So, um, cool. and, the, and, and so that's, that's sort of how we approach that problem. That's really exciting. Um, I would love to see that. Do we have the answers, Chris, to that poll question? All right. We do. Let's I'm sure it does right now. Okay. <laughs> so were they prepared? Well, that's, that's great. That's actually, that's better than I thought. So that's wonderful. And so how would you have answered that question, Scott? Would you have said somewhat? I wouldn't, or, it, yeah, I mean, if I had somewhat 0.5, um, yeah. if, if you okay. will. Um, but so what, what how, how I answered the question before is, is um, the power was being able to get at those insights and those specific indicators really fast in a way to answer those questions. Right. That, so that's why I gave us the point five on that one is because we were we were we didn't have that stuff prepared, but we were we were we were prepared to build that sort of 
quickly. You were part way response. there, right? Yeah, you had a foundation, yep. right? So um, we're going to turn to uh, talk a little bit with Steve now. But before we do, Chris, can you put up that next that next question we have for folks? Let's do it. Also, I have a question coming in from the audience as well from Chris. Um, this is a good one for Scott, but um, great work on open sourcing a model. How did the challenges come to Health First, Health First's attention before they made the decision to assist? Um, so how did you guys sort of discover those challenges and how did it come to your attention? Um, uh, how did the COVID challenges? Uh, right. mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, I think it's it's relatively like anyone who's watching the news is 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 aware that and we we serve 1.5 now million lives in New York City and ten, you know and those tend to be the most vulnerable, so I think everyone in the company company was acutely aware that this is going to impact us tremendously. This is going to impact like human lives tremendously. So it was never a question of that like there, that we had to do something. It was. What are the th what are the tools that we have in analytics to address them, um, and those and, and 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 the answer to that was we we're able to target specific people for specific reasons and provide solutions to meet those specific reasons, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's that's sort of um, how we approach that. Right. Got it. Okay. Um, all right. So let's let's turn now to Steve. So Steve, your job's a little different than, than either Dave's or, or Scott's. Can you just talk a little bit about the work that, that you guys do, that your team does, and who you serve? Sure. So Strata Decision Technology is a provider of financial platforms throughout the healthcare industry, largely the uh, health systems. So we serve a couple of hundred different health systems, so thousands of hospitals, budgeting, forecasting, planning, capital management. Uh, so we, we've been in the thick of it, not quite on the front lines either, but uh, right. everything everybody knew about their about their business kind of kind of went away. Uh, my team uh, within Strata, I came on board a couple of years ago. The CEO is an old friend. And for me, this is what I call fun employment uh, because it's just a hoot to move from running companies to being able to do the stuff I love. Uh, the group does a few things. So we've got this vast data source from hundreds of health systems. So we do benchmarking work. Uh, we are developing standards, which I'll talk about in, in just a second. Uh, we do insight studies on drugs, on different care issues, and COVID mm -hmm. uh, is one of, one of those uh, now, and uh, predictive modeling around forecasting uh, volumes. Uh, for the financial sector, unlike the clinical side of things, there are no standards. So we've uh, pulled together, a no it's a lot of normalization work, a lot of use of natural language processing to is one person's radiology department is another person's imaging department. There are 947 ways people declare somebody being a physician. So if you're trying to look at physician uh, activity or same thing on nursing, uh, really trying to bring all that data together. Uh, so we spend a, spend a lot of time yep. uh, on that supporting okay product directly, but also building out cool analytics within, uh, within our products. So when, when COVID cases really started to climb, what were some of the things that your clients were turning to you for? And how were you, and how were you yeah. trying to help? Yeah, so we, we even started thinking about this a little bit before it hit hard uh, in Seattle and New York, both uh, markets where we have clients. Um, I was uh, out, in, out in Utah in January uh, and we were having a discussion with some friends and saying, this is gonna be bad uh, here and it's gonna really be devastating to the health system. So we were thinking about it, but what happened immediately for clients, uh, and we have a tracker that we've put out that looks at volumes, things were down 50 and 60% in a matter of weeks. And so there was a scramble uh, to try and understand two things. Am I unique in what's going on uh, right. with me? Are other people seeing that? So we put together a volume uh, tracker. And the other was, uh, so what are the implications of this gonna be? What does COVID look like from a cost profile? So let's look at data in Italy and China, compare that because you couldn't identify a COVID case um, at that point in time. Right. You had to look for respiratory distress, mechanical ventilation, um, what kinds of things were, were coming in. So we did a lot of modeling 
to help people understand uh, costs. Uh, behind the scenes, we, we had a fair amount of influence in looking at what are the uh, DRG payment kickers uh, need to be for COVID versus say a pneumonia patient, because that's what people were using um, at the time uh, to try right. and code these things. Right. And uh, for clients generally, okay, if my volumes are down 50 to 60%, um, how do I rebuild a forecast for the rest of the year and uh, everything from uh, the right. cost of PPE to the cost of these patients to I've got this big fixed cost base that I've allocated. Those models no longer work when you're 50% down um, in, in volumes. And so we, we spent a lot of time and continue to spend a lot of time with clients, helping them understand costs and how to forecast and reforecast uh, right. the rest of the year, capacity planning, those kinds of things. What, um, what were some of your biggest challenges as you, as you were working with these heads of analytics across the country? What was the hardest thing about yeah, trying to help them? Uh, a couple things. First, um, you know, you start to see this data flow through, and I'm sure Scott saw the same thing. Th these are people, right, that are dying. These are people that are you know, saying it's very, very hard to look at this data, uh, knowing that that patient record number is is a human being that's it's in trouble, and for clients going through the same thing, uh, dealing with their colleagues. So there's just this highly charged emotional uh, environment, and we weren't even the ones seeing the patients. Uh, obviously, uh, the, uh, analytically, the big challenge was every model everybody ever had was blown up, right? And so when you've got allocation models, uh, again, going back to that fixed cost, um, your PPE, your staffing, what if people get sick? Just having that data available to work with uh, was really the biggest challenge. You didn't have all the data connected the way you wanted it connected uh, rebuilding these models in a, in a state of perpetual unknown, particularly in the very, very early days, our length of stay, who's going to get really sick, how's this going to spread across your ICUs, and what are those costs going to look like? Right. Um, you, you might know at a micro level, but um, at a macro level, trying to understand um, these patient populations when you had no idea what was really going to happen. Uh, right. That was really one of the one of the biggest challenges we had right. analytically. Right. Um, let's see what the challenges are that other people were facing. If we uh, can get an answer. Mm -hmm. Wow. Fascinating. Okay. Okay. Yeah, not not a surprise. Not a surprise. Um, the uh, I, I think this has un unveiled uh, an understanding about ready access to data. You know, to do modeling overnight and normalizing it, cleaning it up, uh, particularly in, the, in our end, uh, large health systems. It's right. very, very difficult and, to get at. And I, I think it also speaks to the point of, uh, of how you, I, I think building the models ends up being the easy part, but getting them into the different technology systems that can actually affect change is a huge part of this whole journey that we're all on. Right. How did you guys end up using it, Scott? Talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, it was it was a real call to action across uh, a bunch of different uh, departments, and from pharmacy, clinical, retention, uh, marketing. Every everybody was at the table, which really didn't happen before. And and the dozens of IT teams that we needed to engage with to make this all happen. So what we what we did with one of the first things we did with the COVID nineteen risk index uh, was was connected to a digital marketing campaign through a product called Twilio, um, which is the first time we had ever done anything like that in our history as a health plan. We'd never sent a chat or a text message to a member before. Um, and we didn't want to send generic like, hey, COVID is bad and like you should go to this website to learn more. Like we wanted right. specific data-driven like points. So we, 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 what we did was use the model to say these, these members are at high risk and they're not known to our current care management programs and they're not known to any of the programs that we use to identify members. So they don't really engage with Health First at all. So we, we combined that, those two pieces of information with other bits like did they take, have they been to their PCP lately or, uh, you know, should they be on an asthma medication and are, and they are, are not. Um, and so that was the one we focused on at the start and we said right. high risk people on people who should be on asthma medication, but aren't like we should provide specific, like a specific chatbot decision tree 
uh, that is sort of driven by the AI model, right? To say like, right. okay, you need, um, because of X, Y, Z, you go down this pathway. And if you reply no, then like, okay, we'll just send you an, to the urgent care or we'll try to get you in touch with capsule to deliver your medications, that kind of thing. So really targeted um, as, as opposed to generic. And that was, a, that was across the entire company um, in, a, in a speed that was, we, we never had before. That's like, amazing. It never happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, I would imagine that, that uh, it's just not ever going to go back to the way that it was. Right? No, and I, I hope yeah. not. Yeah, I, don't, I, think, I think that's a good thing. Right. I do too. Um, that's great. So um, now I've got uh, some questions for just anybody at this point. Uh, I sure. would love to know what's the biggest difference in how the work has evolved versus before COVID. So I think we heard some of yours, Scott, but um, I'd love to hear, Steve, for you. How do you think it's going to be different? Um, at our clients or internally for Strata, I would say at, at clients, the ability for rapid response of their analytics teams, um, you, you, you just don't have um, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 15 weeks to build the model, test the model, yeah. check the data, bring the data together. There are infrastructure uh, requirements of that, uh, not a big bang uh, believer in terms of trying to get everything into one place. I think you've got to know how to assemble data from different disparate resources across your organization and have those models all pre-built um, of how you're going to link data together. So I think a lot more emphasis on being prepared for anything and how you bring your data together mm -hmm. is one. Yeah. And then much more um, you know, rapid model development, having the kinds of connectors, the kinds of models that, that you have all built. And it's not a, not a plug for you guys, but you can't, you can't just try and do everything de novo every day uh, when these kinds of crises are going to hit. This is certainly not uh, the last one. We may have surges uh, here uh, right. right now. We may have surges into the fall and, and being prepared uh, in the way Scott was to pull that data together, I think is going to be um, really critical. And the, the second one that I think is really important for us to talk about is uh, the black box issue of, of AI in general and data science in general. Um, there is going to be more scrutiny than ever uh, over the quality of the data, the ability to defend your model, the ability to prove that what you're doing uh, actually works versus, oh, you know, we've, we've learned this or this seems to be the case. Uh, we're seeing way too many uh, publications that are getting out to market. Uh, I won't name the, the ones that have recently been retracted, but there's right. been an emphasis on uh, we have to show be able to work. replicate it. We have to be able to inspect the data, show your work exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What about you, Dave? What do you think? Yeah, I, on that last point, I think that, you know, the black box in the model, it, this is a point that I just sort of feel very strongly about from a data science perspective. I think there's a lot of sense among data scientists of like, we need to make models explainable so that people will understand them and trust them. But the implication there from the data science perspective is that, well, we know the models, I know the models, right? I just have to convince the users it's right. And uh, from having done this, like that's not the case. The, the case is if you actually haven't ever built explainability into your model, um, explainability makes your model more accurate and, and it makes it more accurate maybe not in a very technical ROC curve goes up but in the sense of it will be more useful to the people who are using it to make a decision um, when you see explainability it can root out problems in the data that are coming in it might be that the model's fine but if it's getting fed by bad data you'll see that in explainability. you'll right. see you define the problem wrong um, you know it, it, example we tend to use is with care management uh sometimes care managers look at a risk score and they say this person has cancer i can't impact cancer so why are you calling them high risk well we've built a model that isn't actually addressing who's going to be benefit from care management we've built a model to predict who's going to be high cost and so now we can tune that model a little bit more towards the right question which is who's going to benefit from care management so i think explainability is important and i think it's it's the tools and the methods, but I also think it's data scientists uh, coming to terms with the fact that the, the role here isn't to explain it so that people will believe your model. The role is to add explainability so that you can know what to do to build a better model. 
Uh, and that's how we view explainability. And I think, you know, COVID and these changes, the speed with which things are moving is helping to accelerate that. Right, right, that's right. Um, so what are you, is there anything that you guys are gonna stop doing now? You go, man, I just, I, I can't either can't afford it anymore or the world is gonna be shifting. And that's from a, from a data science and analytic perspective things that you just won't bother to do anymore. Actually, for us, I would say, I, I don't think that there's anything that we will stop doing. Um, mm -hmm. We are focusing down. Uh, I think uh, our priorities for the next year, I think have focused a little bit differently for, mm -hmm. for clients in terms of the order in which certain work is gonna get done. But, um, Generally speaking, we're we're just forging ahead uh, on on what we're doing, but lo a lot more emphasis on uh, on what uh, what Dave was talking about, explainability and utility for end users versus uh, there's there's no room for um, can do's. There's only room for should do's. Right, right. Okay. I, I have. I mean. One thing you know, we would like to stop doing is sort of generic risk scoring. Um, I, I think, you know, COVID showed that, you know, finding the people who are at risk for vulnerabilities from COVID is different than finding people who are at risk in general. And if you want to provide actionable, specific interventions that really can get somebody to move and change behavior, uh, a general, you're high risk is not going to cut it. Uh, That's right. You got to give people risk scores that are targeted to here's the thing you're doing and here's the specific reason why that's, that's going to specific, specifically put you at risk for something. Yeah. This event, right? Right. And, and generic risk scores aren't going to cut it. We, um, we sort of had that problem at the start of this too. I think half of the org was like, why haven't we done this already? This is awesome. And then the other half is like, well, we already know who's high risk. Right. Um, and um, it, it's really, uh, it's, it's part of the conversation. It, it's in the theme of general explainability of like, well, I, well, we can see that if we, if we take this other view of risk, that this whole other population bubbles at the surface that we wouldn't have caught with just Charlson or just, you know, just ED utilization in the past. Those are fine indicators by themselves, but, but, um, but, but that target approach, um, that persuasion is, is, is part of the process for, for what we had to go through. Right. right. Carol, I want to ask you a question since uh, you've just been able to ask them. Okay. Um, you're, you're a public, you're, you're into the public health, uh, public health right. world. Thing. How do you think that some of the disparities we've seen come out publicly it becomes a requirement in how people build models and, and new data we may even need as a, you know, things you're going to stop or start doing. Right. No, I, I think it's a, um, I think it's a really important question, especially now, uh, even in the backdrop of, of the racial tensions that we're seeing. Um, so I, when I look at the racial disparities that we've seen, um, and there are pe people have asked me, they're like, you know, were you surprised by that, by what we've seen? And, and I would say, unfortunately, no, that for myself, for those of us that have studied health equity, um, we, it, they are heartbreaking and they are expected. So it's, 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 um, they're not new. These things, they were pre-pandemic realities. And what it's done is, is COVID created this kind of horrific uh, trifecta of the biopsychosocial forces at play. Um, there's increased exposure, right? Because people um, of color are disproportionately in essential jobs, or they live in denser housing, or they're taking public transportation. They're also more vulnerable um, because they have higher rates of these underlying conditions linked to more severe illness, which is what we modeled, and they have less access to quality health care. And when those forces come together, what you see is that in, and I look, there's 32 states in DC where people of color are disproportionately a share of cases and deaths, like Wisconsin. African Americans are 27% of all deaths, but 6% of the population, which is amazing. 
or at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital where Latinos are 35% of pre-pandemic patients, but they're now over 80% of the COVID cases that are inside that building. And, and so I think what my wish for data science and analytics as a, both an opportunity and an obligation, we can change things. And, and I think, um, so what I want us to chat a little bit about is actually is bias. We've actually been talking a little bit about it, but I don't know, do you guys remember a headline last year where there were some, uh, it was a headline last year about racial bias and algorithms used in population health management. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. remember that? Dave's kind yep. of saying, yeah. Okay, and these were used to assess or algorithms to assess risk and enroll patient and care management, just like Dave was talking about. And those algorithms led to white patients being more likely to be enrolled in health management programs than black patients that had similar conditions and severity. And you're like, what? And when you talk with experts, what they say is not only can that kind of bias happen, they say that we should expect that kind of bias to happen. But since nobody wants to build bias in, the question is, what can we do about it? And the first thing that I would say, and my inner actuary gets to say this, is stop predicting cost. Cost is off. If you need to know cost, then predict cost. But, but it's just there because traditionally it's been the only variable that we had. But yeah. the data is better than that. The math is better than that. The platforms exist. We can do better than that. And guess what? When they change the outcome, in that one example, researchers looking at that Optum case, bias yep. was reduced by 84%, which is amazing. So, but that means it's asking the right question, predicting the right outcome. But my question for Dave is, if, if we know the answer to cost, but okay, we know that one, but what if I don't know if bias is in my models? How can I look? What can I, is there data science for that? Yeah, yeah, and I, um, I think, you know, it's important to recognize that bias is a, a, a complex issue and there's many different sources of bias that you can have. Um, there, you know, if your underlying data set is biased, that's a very difficult uh, kind of bias to evaluate machine learning. But there's also, you know, bias that can come in because of the way you structure your algorithm, your, test or training sets, the way you run the experiment, or just, you know, the algorithm. Um, many of those sources of bias now have fairly good tests. So there are very good metrics to determine um, whether or not there's bias in a data set. And it's actually important, it, you know, I think it's a, a young field. One of the problems right now, if you go to do this, is not that there aren't metrics to assess bias, it's that there right. are two. Um, uh, there are, there are, there is a, a famous paper that came out, a little well, famous to data scientists who study bias, maybe, uh, <laughs> that I think had, you know, That's 20 more. definitions of fairness, um, uh. definitions of fairness. So it's still an area where you, you know, I, I think there are tools available and there's really no longer any reason people shouldn't be assessing their models based on these tools, but you still need to understand, you know, what it is you're looking for, especially in healthcare where, you know, you expect differential outcomes. Um, the, the right answer isn't the model should predict everybody the same. If right. you're predicting breast cancer, that, my, that model should be biased towards women. Um, right, right. And you right. need to take these things into account. But at the same time, um, there are tools available that can account for these things. And, you know, that's some of the- well, One thing I would, one thing I'd add to that, uh, I'd be curious to get commentary as well, is we tend to, do a lot of our modeling in silos of healthcare data. And it's tricky because you're dealing with PHI and things like that. But the, the ability to bring in um, alternative data, third-party data about those people, so you really make sure you're not building models that don't look at other variables we know about people that really could yep. be influencing the model right. and you haven't even thought about it. How are you thinking about that? And we're, we're thinking a lot about how to do that. Um, in within the boundaries of what we can do with the data. Right. So I think for me, I think that um, there's just a general principle of using more data, not just volume, but diversity of data. I think it makes models more robust to situations like this. Yeah. I think companies that have uh, that rely exclusively on kind of histories of utilization and claims are going to be in a world of hurt because the models yeah. just kind of, you know, got this major power down. Um, I think that there's there's an opportunity to to delve into some biology, right? Um, you know, lab tests and things like that that are 
you know, my lab test is my lab test is my lab test. And, and it's not predicated on, I went to the doctor 10 times or four times, you know, mm -hmm. creatinine's high, it's high. Um, so I think that that's, I think that that's part of it too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just the one thing I wanted to go back on bias and data with respect to cost, I don't know if people realize this, you'd mentioned that it can get baked into the data. That's one of the reasons why cost isn't always a good proxy. Um, right. If you think about it with respect to, to racial bias, it's when you think about a, a procedure, it's going to cost 70 cents in Medicaid, a dollar for Medicare, and a buck 30 for a commercial you know, population. Right. And it's baked into the fabric of, of the healthcare system. And so it's that type of structural to data structural bias, mm -hmm. which is yeah. why some of those things happen. I was reviewing a model with a client uh, last week and area deprivation index, which is a neighborhood, yeah. very good neighborhood level socio socioeconomic indicator available across the US uh, compiled from census data. Yep. And that showed up as a major contributing factor in a prediction of pure utilization over the next six month period. <laughs> same client, same data, um, when we looked at people who are likely to have a jump in cost, that factor was not relevant. So what you saw there was there was a socioeconomic factors played a big deal in the utilization, but it got canceled out because that increased utilization was not predicted to generate a lot of increased cost for the low income side. And right. it just disappears. Right. In the it's a very clear right. example. Uh, of exactly what you're talking about, cost not being a very good. Source. Right. Yeah, and costs are actually, a, I, I think they're a poor proxy. Um, costs are better thought of as a consequence, so of, of, a, of an adverse event. And so predict the event, right? And, and then you can intervene on that as you know more about its clinical context and, and uh, are more situationally aware. If you can prevent the bad thing, then you prevent the money, you prevent the expense. And so that's, I think, just a better approach. Oh, oh, there, Carol, like, uh, there's yeah. all, there all, all also is the right. case, and I think this is why we found that population health has not always driven costs down, is because there is as much underutilization as there is overutilization. We just don't know well who is doing either, and and getting at that issue is really important. Right, right. I wanted to do Carol a quick time check. We've got about eight minutes um, left, and this is just wanted to remind everybody this is a good opportunity. If you do have a question, um, go ahead and pop into Q&A and ask that question. Um, I'd like to ask one now. I think this is probably a good question for Dave um, from being in the audience. Um, I see the CV-19 model requires claims data in order to make predictions. So does this mean that this could only be applied to certain types of populations who have this type of data available? Um, and do we plan to extend its usage to a more general population group? If so, how would you do so? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So. Um, and this is one of the things we struggled with with creating the index and how to make it most available. It's a, there's a trade off of accuracy versus uh, availability. We can build a really accurate model that's pretty hard to implement or, or an easier model. Um, so the open source model we released uh, it is based on claims data, but we also have a smaller model um, we released and we released that actually as a web based survey that's at uh, c19 index.com. Um, and that one, and, and we've also open sourced the computation under that one. And that one really works off more of a checklist of comorbidities. So kind of a, you know, have you had a history of X, Y, Z, and a couple other simple questions uh, that allowed it to really go outside of that initial population. Um, that's something we did after the kind of initial launch and paper. So uh, right. you may not have seen it if you just read the original paper. Right. Yeah, actually, one of the things I liked about that one is that it was a nice kind of, in my mind, wine pairing. Um, the, the first data-driven model was, is really more for organizations. Um, and, you know, if you're a hospital or a health plan wanting to, you know, stand that thing up, it's great. But what you can do once you have that, once you know the things that are high risk factors, you can turn those into questions. And then you can create a survey, which is something that an individual could use. And I, um, I remember having my father take it and my mother who had already passed away. It was interesting. He did score her though. And it helped him realize how fundamentally vulnerable she was. Right. And she scored like 98.7 or something. 
You know, it was almost as high a risk score as you could possibly get. And what it did is that he immediately out loud started thinking about all the things that he would do to make sure she was safe, which is kind of the whole point of the survey, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so it was something that you could give to individuals to help them protect their own you know, health and safeguard their health and that of their loved ones. And so it was nice. We had something for organizations and we had this other thing for, for individuals. Um, we've got just a, a few more minutes here. Are there any other questions that um, you guys have for each other? I think we do before we, before we exit. I do think that we have one more for the audience though. Is that right, Chris? We do. Um, okay. So have we heard of any success stories of clinicians using the open source model to drive treatment and care coordination? Does anybody want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, yeah, we've had a we've had a few cases. You know, one of the things is that the primary value of this model uh, often comes into play before somebody ever sees a clinician. Certainly before a person's admitted. Once a yeah. person admitted for COVID, it's bad. Uh, you know, that they're now in a serious situation, and 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 the vulnerability index doesn't really add up um, add much compared to what they're getting from the hospital information, but. So really where we've seen the biggest value in terms of this index is in driving preventative, preventative measures like driving, you know, getting people to shelter at place longer, getting resources to people to help them, to help enable them to shelter in place, getting right. them prescription delivery. Yeah. So well. we, one, of the, one of the things that uh, Health First did at the start of this was, was think about areas where there's food deprivation and really respond to that preventatively, right? And say, how can we get people who probably are at risk for severe complications, get them not going to the grocery store where they could pick up COVID? Um, right. And you can imagine that that, that kind of risk mentality would, would play a part what, if and when there's a, there's a second wave of this. It's like, who do we have to keep in place and what do we have to get them to, to make sure that they don't go out? Right. And I think that's very similar to um, what the folks at Medical Home Network did. So they, like you, Scott, they were some of the first ones that just said, hey, we're, we're ready to go and scored the population and they joined that vulnerability with information they knew about social isolation and yep. people that just didn't have a support structure. And so they became the highest of the high and they sent you know, their care management teams out, maybe it was virtually, I, uh, I think more virtual, although some could have been face-to-face, -face. we'd have to ask uh, Art. Um, but they were very focused on that very issue, Scott, which is, Nobody wants yeah. to leave home during a pandemic, but some people have to, you know, yeah. they, they need toilet paper, they need, you know, prescriptions, they need food, and they don't have a support network to help them out. So, um, and they had a yeah. lot of success with that. And I, uh, one thing I want to jump in is one, one of the preliminary findings in the like mortality from COVID data that has come in, 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 in the very like, you know, we've, we've had a lot of, lot of those cases, right? and social isolation and number of family members does look like it's a, a risk factor. Um, and right. which is just, you know, devastating. So um, right. trying to get, trying to really prioritize that kind of group of people is, is what we'd want to do. Okay. All right, Mr. Chris, we've got one more question. We'd love to uh, get some insights into. Well, let's pop that up here. So you're going to see another poll question. And let me pull that up, come up on your screen. There we go. We'd love to know from you guys, what do you think is going to be the biggest change on data science from COVID? I, I think that um, personally, the, the talent question is, is what I would answer is, is rather than simply focusing on people who are excellent at software or implementing like advanced algorithms and stuff. It's, it's really the people who can, you know, speak to the organization can, you know, talk, talk that same language, you know, persuade, uh, meaningfully explain models in, and, and deliver them to, to the business. Um, like going, shifting away from the, the coders and to that more like data savvy consultant. I really, I really do think that's w one of the biggest things I've seen personally. That's great. Um, okay. What do you think, Steve?
Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I'm mute. I think you're muted. Sorry. Uh, there, there's going to be an increased emphasis on this speed to insight. Um, it, it just can't take 15 or 20 weeks to address a question that's come up. So the ability to provide answers to a clinician in real time, the ability yeah. to answer a public health question in real time. See, I got it right. I didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and, hand signals. And, uh, to, because that, that that's that's all that that's ultimately how um we're i think there's an, a built-in assumption uh about data accuracy and things like that but uh, yeah. people want to see the time to value decreased and that's where um whether it be you know things that amazon is trying to bring out or google's trying to bring out or, or that you're bringing out the ability to move faster and not build stuff a hundred times that our people have built at scale as platforms uh, is going to be really, really critical. As data scientists spend way too much time uh, figuring out how to get all the ingredients together to bake the bread. Um, yeah. And they really need to start relying on, on better ways of, of getting that. It can't be as artisanal a craft as it's been. Right. We're Panera, man. We need it every day, everywhere. <laughs> That's what people expect. Yeah. I think Scott's and Steve's answers really to me are two sides of this of the coin, right? That the tools need to get better, which will enable it to go fat will enable us to get answers faster. And then the bottleneck is not going to be building the model. The bottleneck is communication, building the relic right model, because you understand the business, mm -hmm. and then deploying that model into the into the business process. And so you, you're going to need to see that shift in skills that Scott's talking about. That's essential to making things happen faster. Right. That's, uh, and with that, Carol, we are two minutes over. Um, All right, very good. Really so, good answers. Yeah. So allow me first to um, thank the panelists here. So to Steve and to Scott um, sure. for you. being here. It was just really wonderful to have this conversation with you. And, um, and to everybody who, who joined us today. So we know that everybody's super busy. And even though it may seem like things are opening up, we also know that nothing's really changed and everybody is staying vigilant and hopefully staying safe and sound. And yep. thanks for being with us today. Cool. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You, Dave. Right. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, yeah. panelists. Bye. Bye.